A team of astronomers has used NASA's Chandra X-ray Observatory and ESA's XMM Newton to study a large group of galaxy clusters with a surprising result. Galaxy clusters are the largest objects in the universe held together by gravity and thus can reveal lots of information about the cosmos. This most recent study, which included the well-known Perseus cluster and 72 others, has uncovered a mysterious X-ray signal. Astronomers are intrigued by a spike of intensity at a specific wavelength of X-ray light in the data because of one proposed explanation. Scientists think that a hypothetical particle called a sterile neutrino may in fact be responsible for this spike of intensity. Some scientists have proposed that the sterile neutrino could be a candidate for dark matter, something that makes up about 85% of the universe, yet does not emit or absorb light. While they are excited about this finding, the researchers say it's too early to claim whether or not this mysterious X-ray signal is real or whether or not it is indeed the signature of the sterile neutrino. They'll keep gathering data and looking at other galaxy clusters to make sure they see it elsewhere. In the meantime, they'll be looking at their theories to see where else the physics may take them. Good evening and welcome to Cassini Huygens Mission Control at NASA's Jet Propulsion Laboratory in Pasadena, California. The flight team is in place for SOI, that is Saturn Orbit Insertion, and that is when the spacecraft must be captured by Saturn's gravity or it will fly right on past the planet and the mission is over. Time to turn back around to the SOI burn attitude or pointing position and light up the rockets. We have a Doppler signature that you turn on. Do that. It's 9.05 p.m. Pacific Daylight Time. The SOI burn is approximately 92% complete. And we expect to track the Doppler now through the end of the burn. Go ahead, it's going up. Go ahead, it's going up. The Doppler has flattened out. Woo! Okay, we have burn complete here. Four years for this moment. Yeah. We're still following under the programmers. Just we cut the programmers away. We're going to let it free fall for 10 seconds and accelerate. And do you tell us again what that free fall does? Free fall allows gravity to do its job and allow us to accelerate to our test condition. And uh, the faster we let the vehicle fall, you know, the more it is able to accelerate and give us a more representative test condition. Uh, so the, the closer, more closely matches the flight entry that we'll see during EFT-1. And we've got our, we're under drogues. So we've had a good forward bay cover separation. I'm just tracking the, the PTV, the test vehicle, at the moment on my binoculars. And we just cut away. Three pilots out. The mains have started inflating. Just heard the pop from the chute inflating. One of, I don't know if Rad has this on camera. One shoots inflated, the other two are not yet. This was one of our other yeah, planned test objectives, which was simulating. Okay, good. Yeah, and so that's simulating what happens if one of the reefing stages opens prematurely for some reason, and um, if it skips a stage, because uh, we designed this assuming that the parachutes share the reefing. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, reefing is is a way to open the the parachute in in um, uh, gently or softly. Um, if you went full open, it's think of uh, going extremely fast and hitting your brakes really, really hard. You put a lot of energy uh, into things, right? It's, it's uh, 
dumps a lot of energy both into the structure of the vehicle and in the parachute. And so we have ropes that constrain the diameter of the parachute and they have pyrotechnic timers that allow them to open up say 10% initially and then I think, uh, I don't know if Molly remembers the exact number, I think it's 10 and then 20% and then we go full open and that allows you to open up the chutes gracefully and uh, kind of more slowly spread the energy into the parachutes and into the vehicle. Uh, again, by reefing, you kind of control and manage that energy and it allows you to uh, not design uh, and carry quite as much mass in the system. Well, it looks great from here. We're seeing a really good view. Thanks uh, for getting that for us. Um, I guess while we watch it uh, make its way down to the ground, we can take a few more questions. We actually have one for, for Molly from Nick Lopez. Um, says, what kind of temperatures do you predict you'll see during entry uh, based on your wind tunnel testing? Um, well, we don't get up to the actual temperatures that we're going to see in, in flight in the wind tunnel test. But for EFT-1, we're predicting a peak surface temperature of around 4,000 degrees Fahrenheit. That's two times the temperature of molten lava. Um, and that's just for our Orion's first flight test, which isn't going to completely stress the system as, as far as Orion will once we actually fly Orion's real missions out to the moon and beyond. For those missions, we're going to be seeing peak surface temperatures upwards of 5,000 to 5,200 degrees Fahrenheit. So that brings up another question that we've gotten from uh, Philip online, and he asks, uh, how can the module be adapted for future missions? Does it need to change before the next flight? Certain parts of the vehicle are, have already changed between the first flight test and what we're going to be flying on future missions. Um, but the, the material that surrounds the vehicle, we call it its thermal protection system, and that's what protects it from those um, high temperatures on the surface. It's a, an insulative layer that's also designed to burn away and take that energy away from the surface. Um, that thickness of that material can change depending on your on um, your mission. And then also, we'll learn a lot from the exploration flight test one or Orion's first flight test, and that will feed into the design for the future flight test. We might need to um, adjust certain thicknesses or adjust what material is used for certain regions. And uh, those are the design changes that we'll go into between the first flight test and the second flight test. Great. And it looks like we've got uh, the vehicle touched down now on the desert in Yuma. Everything looking good, Stu? Yes. Uh, I don't know if you see the, so I'm assuming Brad's got the shot. You see two of the three parachutes, uh, and they're just starting now, starting to deflate. Um, and like I said, the ground winds here today are in the um, um, seven, eight, nine knot range, and uh, these parachutes are very effective. And so, and one of the things that we have to do is make sure we get them def deflated. And these, the last two, are hanging on for a little bit. But, uh, but the vehicle's down. It was a good test, uh, and I saw the Ford Bay cover. We obviously had a good clean separation. Uh, it's down on the ground already. Yeah. It's so what what would be happening now if this were um, the the test flight in December and we were on the ocean? What what would uh, the recovery team be doing? The recovery team, once the vehicle's down and uh, once any all the other objects like uh, are clear, so they know that there's no hazards, uh, the uh, recovery crews will take off out of the the the, uh, the navy ship that's. Uh, in the in the landing area, and we'll be heading out in some small boats and Zodiacs to go and uh, recover the Ford Bay cover, and then go and re recover the, the the vehicle itself. And